on behalf of St. George Teacher Training Institute, I warmly welcome all of you to our webinar, Preparing Your Heart to Teach, Helping Children to Become the Leaders of Tomorrow. Uh, so if I were to give a small introduction to our institute for the participants from outside, St. George Teacher Training Institute has an experience of 20 years in producing about 5,000 trained and qualified teachers. It offers many recognized professional qualifications in the School of Teaching, Business, and Computing to a large number of both foreign and local students. So to begin with today's forum, we have our main guest speaker, Mr. Gavin McCormack, joining with us from Sydney, Australia. Also, we have Ms. Noura Sani, who will be sharing her thoughts and experiences as well. Mr. Gavin will be enlightening us on the topics, the power of observation in our classrooms, and how essential skills can, be prepared, can prepare our students for the future. What you're going to witness now is going to be very valuable to you. Therefore, pay great attention and please feel free to ask any question related to what will be discussed today. Gavin McCormack is a trained Montessori teacher, children's author, teacher trainer, philanthropist, and school principal. While working in the teaching profession for over 20 years, he has used his experience and training to understand what it means to educate with true intention. Initially trained as a mainstream primary school teacher, Gavin retrained as a Montessori teacher where he found the understanding and experience that has inspired him to build several schools and teacher training centers in the Himalayans, the Himalayan regions of Nepal. Gavin has trained teachers, parents, and educational leaders across the world. His passion for educational reform, with a strong emphasis on Montessori within the home, has driven him to attempt and put these thoughts into words. Then again, we have Ms. Lura Sani, who's a senior lecturer for Master of Education, City and Gales Advanced Diploma in Teacher Training and Assessing Learning, Teaching IELTS teaching English as a foreign language at St. George Teacher Training Institute. She has an associateship at University of West London, licentiateship in teaching drama and speech for University of West London, licentiateship in speech and drama honors Victoria College London, CELTA University of Cambridge, postgraduate certificate in education Murdoch University, Perth, Australia, Master of Education Murdoch University, Perth, Australia, She's also a member of the Society of Speech and Drama, United Kingdom, City and Gales Advanced Accessor, and also an EYFS Coordinator UAE. So, Mr. Gavin, hereupon I would like to uh, hand over the session to you now. Um, thank you so much, Yamali. It's really nice to be here. And I'm so sorry that I was a little bit late. I was stuck in the waiting room. This is a very popular uh, webinar that you're running here, which is nice to see. Um, I do have one request, and that is, um, it's always nice to, if possible, if anyone's got their cameras off and wishes to have their cameras on, that you're not forced to have your camera on. But if you do want to have it on, it's really good because that gives me a bit of interaction as I'm doing the webinar or the seminar here. Um, I get to see your reactions, and that makes it a little bit more 50-50 two-way traffic. So if you do want to put your camera on, you're more than welcome. If you don't want to, obviously, it doesn't really matter. Um, now, firstly, um, it's really, you know, I'm absolutely honoured to be asked to come along here. There's so many wonderful teachers in this seminar, in this webinar today. And I think my whole, um, my whole concept as a teacher uh, and, and a worldwide uh, educational philanthropist and, 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 you know, and I try to dress myself as a change maker. The, the idea of that is to have influence over new teachers so that teachers who come out into the world uh, and walk into classrooms tomorrow, next year, next week, um, they have a different perspective on what teaching can be. I'm not trying to tell you how to teach, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. What I am trying to tell you is that there is another way uh, and there are many other ways that we can teach. And today's seminar particularly, the idea of today will be to be, to be able to look at um, how um, the essential skills that are um, 
so important in the world today, how we can use them in our classrooms. Uh, and number two, we're going to look at how the power of observation works in our rooms and what insights it gives into, into how our students operate in the classroom. So um, without further ado, we'll get started, but also I want to warn you that this isn't just going to be me talking at you for two hours. So the way it's going to run is this, we're going to do 45 minutes of us working together and I'll be showing you some slides and doing some work together. And then for a 15 minute window, we'll have a question and answer session. And then we'll do another 45 minutes um, on uh, the, uh, the power of observation and then we'll have a final question and answer session. But along the way, we actually will be going into breakout groups and then um, there will be a situation where you'll have to work together and you'll have to speak and you'll have to interact. Can you see my screen? If you just want to put your, put your thumbs up and let me know if you can see that PowerPoint that's just loading now. Yes, we can see. Okay, you can see that. Wonderful. Okay. So just before we start, we're going to start, we're going to run this session in kind of two windows here. The first one is going to be about uh, education and a little bit about observation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And I've got a couple of big giveaways today for the audience. I'm going to, uh, throughout the seminar, you'll see a couple of QR codes pop up on the screen. If you hold your telephone up on those QR codes, I've prepared two really amazing documents for you that you can download and you can keep and you can use those in your schools. If you're going to school tomorrow, you can use them immediately tomorrow. It should help you improve your pedagogy. So first of all, innovations in education, how to create amazing classrooms. Now that's the idea. The idea of a school is not that you're an amazing teacher or not that the children are amazing students, is that the, the entire building is inspirational for everybody who comes in. The teachers, the management, the executives, the children, and the parents. This is a community. So school is about community. So today we're going to be talking about how can we make our classrooms amazing? How can we raise the bar in terms of what education looks like? And how can we be more creative in the way we deliver the, the pedagogy to our students? And I'll start by this. This is the most important bit about being a wonderful teacher. And that is that you have to be inspirational. If you stand at the front of your classroom and you are limp and oh, well, today we're going to learn about fractions, you know, the children, they switch off immediately. Your job is to get your students hooked. And we call this the educational hook. And we do, we use the educational hook in a really special way. We use it by telling our students something they will never forget. And I want to start by telling you something today that you'll never forget either. Now, in the picture you're looking at, you might be thinking, why has Gavin got the picture of a guillotine of a public execution in the 1700s on the screen in this PowerPoint presentation about education? Well, I'm going to teach you a little bit of history and you're never going to forget this. In the 1700s, the guillotine and beheading was a normal practice in Europe. For severe crimes, you would be sent to the guillotine the audience would crowd around and they would chop off your head and it was done. That was the end because you'd committed such a serious and heinous crime. Now, the, uh, there was an emperor in, um, in uh, France and he said, you know what? I don't think that chopping off people's heads is very humane. And somebody else said, well, you know, it is humane because it's very quick. Once they chop the head off, it's finished and the punishment is over. And one of his, um, one of his sci main scientists in the parliament said, you know, I'd like to conduct an experiment to find out if it actually is painless. So the emperor said, no problem, you go ahead and do that. So this scientist, he decided for 200 executions in a row, he would crouch down by the basket where the head would fall in. And he would quickly pick up the head and he would call the person's name. And if the person looked at them, it meant that they were still alive for a few seconds after their death. And therefore, it was not painless at all. In fact, it would be a very traumatic way to die. So for 200 executions, he crouched down by the basket. The head was chopped off for a very serious crime. The scientist picked up the head and he said, Thomas, and for every 200 experimental executions, the eyes of the head looked at him. They moved after the head had been chopped off. And therefore, it was banned in Europe and banned all over the world as a public execution form of corporal punishment because it was not painless at all. In fact, it would be extremely terrifying to be alive for about 15 seconds after you had been executed. And this was all down to somebody who said, 
do you mind if I conduct an experiment? Because if it wasn't for that person putting their hand up and saying, excuse me, would you mind if I try something? Maybe we'd still be doing this today and we would never have found this out. And you might think, oh my goodness, why is he starting with such a terrible story? This is shocking. The reason I'm telling you that is in our classrooms, our students will sometimes put their hand up and they will say, excuse me, miss, do you mind if I, and quite often we say, I'm sorry, it says this in the program, I have to teach this. And we shut them down, we don't listen to them. It's time we did. When our students say, excuse me, miss, do you mind if I, we should be saying, I don't mind. Yes, go ahead because we want them to experiment. From experimentation comes great creativity. Okay, let's continue. Now, the big question is, how can we run our institutions, our schools, to establish a culture of collective responsibility? We are all responsible. So first of all, let's get some perspective. Now, I want to, in, I want to kind of instill this into the teachers who are watching today. I want to kind of give you these statements. And you know, if you've got a camera, and I'll share these slides with you later, but I want you to try these in your classrooms as soon as you can. Because when you give your students freedom, quite often in our schools, we have our students sitting down in rows, looking at us, we are the teacher and we have all the knowledge. And if you're quiet and you listen to me, you will know everything that you need to know. But the reality is, when you say that to your students, when you say, sit down and listen to me, what you're actually saying is, good morning students, today you can only be as smart as me, because what I know is all you're going to know. But when we give them some freedom, not complete freedom, but freedom within limits, amazing things happen. Now, I would like to kind of try to encourage the, the teachers here today to try to do these to try to make these statements in their classrooms in the near future. Number one, you can sit wherever you like to your students. I don't mind where you sit. You can sit next to your best friend. You can sit next to the person you talk to the most. You decide where you sit. However, there are some rules in the classroom. If you don't do your work, tomorrow I get to choose where you sit. But today, you can sit wherever you like. We allow the students to make that choice and give them the freedom. Number two, you can work with whoever you wish. I don't mind if you work in a pair. I don't mind if we work on your own. And I don't mind if you work in a group because we have students who learn differently. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. Number three, I don't mind how you show me your research. Quite often in our schools, we have it in our, in our curriculum to say, today we're all going to draw a diagram. But on that particular day, some students, they're not really interested in drawing a diagram. They're more interested in representing their work as a report or as a piece of art or as a show or as a theater production. And we want to encourage students to follow their passion. And therefore, I don't mind how you show me your work on dinosaurs. It's completely up to you. Number four, and this is the hardest one. You can take a little bit longer than the time I have designated if you need our schools are organized in a way where potentially literacy is nine till 10, and then 10 till 11 is mathematics, 11 till 12 is science. But we all know as adults, that's a big problem. If you're in the middle of some work and you've really got into the nitty gritty of your work and somebody says, I'm sorry, Miss Nora, you have to stop now. It's time for this, move on. And Miss Nora says, hey, I was right in the middle of this assignment. I, I was in the middle of writing this document. I was in the middle of creating something beautiful and you have just stopped me in my flow state. So when we see a child who is in there and they're really in it, we want to try as much as we can to leave them there because magical things happen when you are in a state of flow. Nobody, no child, no adult, nobody in the world likes to be stopped when they're in something they absolutely love. That's number four. And number five is this. When you've finished your work, how are you going to share it with other people? And that should be a really important aspect. We'll come to that later on when we talk about the structure of a lesson. Now, the reason I've got this picture here of these children taking a selfie, they're actually taking a selfie with a shoe, if you look at it. And they're all crowding around a shoe to get this selfie. And they're all smiling at the camera, but there is no camera. And this is the point. Our children's imagination is unbelievable. Sometimes we stifle their imagination by telling them everything. Our job is not to tell them everything, just to inspire them enough to be encouraged to, to investigate for themselves. Let's continue. Now, 
I put this together last night for you. And, uh, you know, there are many, many variations of this, but this is my interpretation of what I believe is the perfect lesson, how to structure the perfect lesson. Now, you know, different lessons will structure in different ways. But to me, a, a perfect lesson runs something like this. So an introduction, which is what am I going to teach you today? An explanation. Why am I bothering to teach this to you? Number three, essential skills. What skills are you going to get from this? Not what knowledge. We all know what knowledge you're going to get. You're going to have the knowledge from the lesson. What skills are you going to practice? Number four, the explicit teaching where the teacher actually teaches something. Number five, when I ask questions of my students of what they would like to know next. Number six is the independent part where I let my children go free. Number seven is the representation, which is where the children show me how they have created their work. Number eight is where I allow leadership to take place. And number nine is feedback, which is usually observation. And I've broken this down into these statements here. I actually put this last night into, um, into percentages to allow you to kind of understand how this might look. So in terms of how much time you might spend on each of these, let's consider 100% is about 60 minutes, okay? So your introduction is about 2%. It's very quick. It's just, today we're going to learn about this, okay? And we might write that down as a learning objective. The second part, the explanation, is why are you bothering to attend? If I'm teaching you about dinosaurs, what's the point? Why do you have to sit in this lesson? And I have to validate that. If I can't validate that to my students, I shouldn't be teaching it. I should not be teaching something that I have no idea why I'm teaching it. So if you're teaching fractions to a group of 10-year-olds, but you do not know why fractions are so important, you need to go and do your research before you teach, because before every single lesson, you should be able to sit before your students and say, this is why we're learning about dinosaurs. This is why you need to know about clouds. This is why pollination is very important, because when you validate it, your students understand and they can put the pieces together. So the next one is the essential skills. What skills are you going to learn today? That's about 2% too. The explicit teaching where you're talking and you're at the front and you're teaching something directly, that's only about 15% of your lesson. Many teachers think that should be the whole of the lesson, but actually it's a small window of time. And in that time, all you should be doing is inspiring your students. They're not expecting you to know everything. They're just expecting you to be inspired, to be inspired by their learning. Number five is a very, very important part. And this is the questioning part. This is where you say to the students, Today, I have taught you about this. Now, what would you like to know? And I'll give you an example of that. So you may be teaching about, for example, the solar system. And you may say, today we are going to learn all about planet Earth. And the reason you need to learn about planet Earth is you live on planet Earth. That's why it's so important to you because you live here, it is your home. Now, what would you like to know about the solar system? And all these hands go up in the classroom. Um, can I ask Miss, please, what, you know, how big is Venus? How hot is the sun? Why does there aurora borealis in the sky sometimes? What's a shooting star? Why are there so many stars? Can we live on Mars? All these questions come from the students. Now you don't answer them. That's not your job. You write them down and you say to the students, well done, those questions are brilliant. Now the children have just written their own curriculum now, which is pretty creative. They've just written their own curriculum for the next hour of learning. And then we say to the students, now you can head off in your group and you can do your independent research or investigation. And this is the main bulk of your lesson. So first of all, introduce. Secondly, what skills are we going to learn? Now I'm going to inspire you, then I'm going to question you, and now I'm going to let you go. And when I let you go, I'm going to say you can work with whom you like, you can sit wherever you want, and I do not mind how you show me your research. You can use books, you can use the iPad, you can use a computer, you can sit with whoever you want, you can sit on the floor, work at a table, your piece of work can be art, it can be a report, it can be a piece of drama, you decide what it's going to be. And when you take this as a teaching style, be careful, your students will immediately be ignited. They are so excited by this freedom. But what you can then do is you can take a step back. You don't need to teach anymore. The students are now working together and you can make observations of your students and see how they are going. 
Who's a leader? Who's working with who? Who's having some collaboration issues? And you can make observations of your students, ones you would never, ever normally get to do because you're too busy at the front doing direct teaching. So 30% is representation, where the students allow time to represent their research and show you how they found it. And then we come to the final two parts, which is leadership, where we ask the students to demonstrate what they've learned to other people in the room, to show their work, to meet with another group, to go to another class. And the last part of the lesson is feedback and reflection. And this is crucial. This is quite tricky for some teachers, but this part's crucial. This is where you say to the students, this is what I saw happening while you were working. You were doing amazing leadership. You were working so hard. You were an amazing listener. But also you say to your students, how did I do? Was I a good teacher? Did you like my lesson? Is this something I can do differently next time? And the students might say, well, you were talking a little bit too much or the lesson was a bit boring. And that is completely fine because you need that. As a teacher, you need feedback just as much as your students need feedback as well. So we continue onto our next slide here. Now, this is a really important part. Quite often in teaching, we get caught in a trap where we think that we need to know everything. We think that as teachers, we need to be the oracle of all knowledge. We need to know everything there is to know about everything, but this is simply not true. Number one, it's completely impossible for you to know everything. And number two, when you just distribute knowledge to, to students, you take away the independence. What we should be doing is being really inspiring and then letting it go, letting them go with that. And it's really interesting. And I call it the 20% rule. So if you know everything about dinosaurs, then only give away 20%. Leave it to the children to find out the rest. And this is what's absolutely crucial. Now, maybe uh, you've heard of different types of learning. I'm sure you have. Auditory learners, visual learners, kinesthetic learners. We've all heard of these types of learnings. But have we ever thought about the different types of learners in our class? Now, for the many people who are in this seminar today, 133 people in this seminar today, each and every one of you learns in a different way. None of you are the same. Everyone's unique and different. And the same goes to your students. Now, when we treat our students as all the same, so we say, oh, you know, all of my students learn the same way. I'm just going to teach them all the same way. Actually, we're doing a big disservice. We may hit about 60% of the class, 20% of the children are looking out the window, and 20% of the children are completely bored because this is not the lesson for them. And it's hard to meet everybody's needs. However, if we observe our students, then we get to know the kinds of learners sitting before us. And today, I want, to, I want you to imagine that you're also a student. Because today, um, we are also going to put ourselves in the shoes of our students to see what kind of learner are you? So Minori, for example, who's watching. Minori, you know, when we go into this next part, I, I want to know what kind of learner you are. And I'm going to ask you in a minute to, to, to relay that to the group, because there are four types. So let's have a look at this. So first of all, we must understand the types of learners in our class in order to understand how to teach them. But how do we do that? Well, there are four ways. Number one is you must observe the class regularly. Now, you cannot observe the class if you're standing at the front all day talking, because that doesn't give you a chance to observe. You could, but all the kids will be sitting down silent. So you're not going to see much. When you let them go and you let them free, then you will see amazing leadership take place. And that's what we're trying to look for. So we're going to observe our class regularly. We're going to make sure that's in the curriculum. Number two, we're going to give them choice. So we're going to allow them to choose how they represent their work, who they sit with, and the kind of research they do. We're going to encourage them to work together. You see, the problem we face is this. It's easy for us when all the kids are quiet. It's easy when they're all sitting up straight with their fingers on their lips, because there's no trouble. It's all fine. And the principal, it comes down the hallway and he pops his head in the door and he says, ooh, this is a really nice quiet classroom. Well done, keep going. But actually, it's a failure to have a quiet classroom, isn't it? 
Because can you imagine when you have a quiet classroom, the children aren't talking to each other. They aren't learning from each other. They aren't having debates. They aren't encouraging each other to have problems, collaborate, teamwork, compromise, understanding, empathy, love. All of these things are gone because everyone is sitting silent. We need to let them go. And when we let them go, we observe them. And the last thing is we need to talk to them. And we need to listen to their answers too. And we need to encourage them to be honest. In the school that I run, at the end of each week, we sit with the students and we ask them, how did I do as a teacher this week? Tell me the things I did well. Tell me the things I didn't do so well. And we encourage the students to be honest. And when they understand that they have a voice, they respect us a lot more. So let's have a look at the different types of learners. So here we go. There are four types of learners that we will find in our classrooms. But what are the four types? Number one, the isolated learner. Now, I'm sure there's some isolated learners here in this 128 people group. Isolated learners, they love to have a nice quiet place to work. They prefer to have limited stimulation so they do not want to be facing the classroom. They want to be facing a wall. They want to be, you might think, why would I make a child face the wall? It's not punishment. But these children, they want to have limited stimulation. And if you leave them alone, they will work extremely hard. Now, the problem we sometimes face in our classrooms is we have all the students sitting in twos. Everyone is in twos. You sit with a partner. But if you're an isolated learner, then this is no good for you and you will not get the best. So what I encourage you to do is this. In your classrooms, make sure you've got some tables that are just for one person. And tell the students, you can sit wherever you want. These tables over here are just for one person to sit at. And when you observe the class, you will see the students who want to work on their own because they will choose the one person table. And therefore, you know, who are your isolated learners? Now, if you've got all of your students sitting in pairs, then you're going to fail your isolated learner. And I'm pretty sure there are some people in here, I know on my team, I'm a school principal. I have some teachers, they come to school, they don't go to the staff room, they don't talk about gossip, they don't talk about their weekend, they come in, they teach really hard, and they go home. They're not interested in socializing. They're isolated learners. And I need to make sure that I don't force them to go to the staff room. I don't force them to talk when they don't want to, because they don't want to. But they're amazing teachers. And you will have students in your classroom, too, who are amazing students. But if they don't have a place to work on their own, that's a problem. Number two, we have what's called our parallel learners. I actually took this photo in Indonesia. Um, our parallel learners. So what is a parallel learner? Well, a parallel learner is a child that likes to sit next to their best friend. Now, maybe their best friend is not on the same level as them. They may be differentiated with their ability levels. And we sometimes move them apart because maybe they talk too much. And we say, right, you two are talking too much. You need to split up. But actually, that's a failure in itself. Parallel learners, they like to work with their friend. Now, it's not because they like to chat all day. It's because their best friend is their comfort blanket. That's the person, their security is right next to them. So when they have a problem, when it gets too hard, when they're struggling, when they're finding it difficult, they won't put their hand up and talk to you because it's too embarrassing. They will whisper to their partner, I need help. Can you help me? I don't know what to do. And they will help them because they are best friends. These are parallel workers and they work together really well and they back each other up and they might chat a lot but that chat is healthy chat it's really good chat because they each one of them is reassuring the other one that it's okay you're doing just fine and we have teachers in our schools who are just the same as this you might come in one of you works in the english department another one works in the science department you have no idea what each other's teaching but every day you meet up in the staff room and you sit together and you have a good old chat. How was your morning? How were your lessons? What are you up to? How's your family life? And you get a chance to check in with them. And it makes you feel good. And then you go back to your work, just like your parallel learners. 
I hope, Minori, you're deciding which one you are, because I'm going to ask you in a second which one you are. Okay, next one is your cooperative learner. Now, this is a photograph from my school. These are two boys from my school. I took this photograph. Now, a cooperative learner are two students who also sit together. Now, these students are a little bit different to a parallel worker, because these students are exactly the same ability level. They do exactly the same work at exactly the same time together all the time, every single day, because they rely on each other exactly for that support. And they must do the things together because that means that they're doing okay. It's going okay because my friend's doing it. I'm doing it. Now, these two boys here, you can see, they're studying polygons. And I set this work for them, actually. And I, we studied, we, we researched polygons. And I said, you can do your work however you like. They sat together on a, on a cooperative table. And they decided to make a book about polygons. Now, take a look at that book. They've used the same paper, same color. They've used the same everything. And what's really interesting is that they're working really, really hard. You know why they're working really hard? Because they're allowed to support each other. And we're allowed, they're allowed to talk. They're allowed to check in. They're allowed to chat. But look at the work they're doing. It's a miracle work. But look at their work. They're doing the exactly the same work at exactly the same time. Even the same part of the page. Cooperative learners rely upon each other heavily. And your last one is your collaborative learner. And these are students who work together in large groups, maybe four or five students here, and they do teamwork. These guys need to sit on the floor. They might choose to do their work as an art project. And you will find when your collaborative learners work together, your team comes together, five or six children, you'll find a leader who will take charge. You'll say, OK, guys, you get the paper, you get the pens, you get the colors. We'll meet on the big table in five minutes and we're going to make our, you know, this was a, a photosynthesis lesson on the on the leaf but they work together now in this lesson with collaborative learners there'll be a lot of chat there'll be a lot of chat because these children are working their way through learning and they're teaching each other but what's really really interesting here is they might be a bit of debate you see there might be a child who says you know what i don't really like working with you you're too bossy i'm leaving this group and that's fine you let them leave because in that moment the child will leave and then i'll go to a parallel table a collaborative, a co sorry, a cooperative table or um, an, an isolated table. They'll leave and they'll find another place to work. And the person who was being bossy will think to himself, oh, God, if I'm really bossy all the time, no one's going to work with me. And we don't need to intervene. We don't need to stop it. We just leave it because that is what the real world is like. If you are a teacher who's really bossy and you're really mean and no one's going to want to talk to you in the staff room, and that's the real world. So our four types of learners, I'll just quickly go through all four of them so you can see them very quickly. We have our isolated learner, works on their own. We have our parallel workers, working together, different levels. We have our cooperative lear learners, working together, same ability level. And our collaborative learners, all working together in a large group. And the reason I'm showing you that is we talked about the perfect lesson before, and especially the part where you say, now, children, off you go and do your research I don't mind where you sit, I don't mind who you work with, and I don't mind how you show me your research on dinosaurs. You've got 30 minutes, off you go, and the kids will all go. Some will go to an isolated table, some to a cooperative table, some to a parallel table, and some to a collaborative table or on the floor. And then that is the magical gateway for you to step back and observe and look for those skills taking place. And we'll talk about skills a little bit later on. Now, I think this is really, really important. And I've put this picture of me here because I love geography. I'm a rock climber, I love climbing mountains, and I love geography. So I like to bring a lot of geography into my lessons. And each one of you as teachers today out there has a special niche. You all have a special talent or a hobby. It could be fishing, it could be painting, it could be cooking. It doesn't matter what it is. I encourage you to bring that passion into your classrooms. Wherever you have a chance to bring your passion into the room, bring your passion into the room. Because when you bring your passion into the classroom, the children can sniff it from a thousand miles away, and your passion becomes their passion. So if you're teaching history, and you are passionate about a certain country, bring that country's history into the lesson. 
if you are interested in cooking and you are studying, you know, the evolution of the fish, then you bring in a fish, you study it, and then you cook it, and the kids all eat it. And you will bring that passion into your classroom. And when you do, your students will sense your passion and they will also become passionate too. Each and every one of us has a passion and it's our job to bring that passion into school for two reasons. Number one, to inspire your students, but number two, to inspire yourself. Because you don't want to be the teacher you didn't want to be. You want to be the teacher you always wanted to be. You want to come in with passion. You want to come in with poise. You want to come in with all the skills that you have. Now, I want to go back just for a second to Minori. And I'm sorry, Minori, to put you on the spot. But if you could unmute yourself. Now, yeah. let's think about you in particular. Maybe not now, but maybe as a child. Were you mm -hmm. an isolated mm -hmm. learner, a parallel learner, a cooperative learner, or a collaborative learner? And tell us why. I have always, can you hear me properly, Gavin? Yes, I can hear you fine. I've always been um, an isolated learner. Okay. So just quickly then, while we're on that, what happened in school? Did you have to sit with somebody else at school? Yeah, there were projects where the teachers would make us sit together and do like projects, works and stuff. And I didn't actually quite like it. I really enjoyed it when I could just, you know, focus with like less stimu stimuli because I would always get distracted with a lot of stimuli. So the less distractions there is, I could like focus and, you know, get my flow going. And that's when I'm more productive when I, you know, do things alone by myself. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Amazing. And, and I guess the reason I'm asking you that is because when you go into your classroom next, it'll be very important that you go, oh, OK. And, you know, I, I hope that all the teachers here today, all 132 of you go, the first thing I'm going to do is get a list of all of the students in my class. I'm going to watch them doing some independent work and I'm going to put it next to their name, isolated, parallel, collaborative, cooperative. So I know exactly where they find their strong point and I'm going to make sure they've got a space to work in the room. That's very, very important. Are you a teacher at the moment, Minora, in a classroom? Um, I am, Gavin, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, how do your students sit? What's the setup like? Okay, well, Gavin, technically no, because tomorrow is my actual first ever teaching class that I get to actually teach for an actual school. So I'm pretty excited. So right now I'm just doing online teaching privately on the side. So okay. um, yes, yeah, so this is like a great you know opportunity for me to like see. All so right. Then, okay, thank you. And I'm sorry to pick on you. Just the other no, camera I could see. So I wanted to choose you. That's all right. I'm, I'm happy very to answer. Very important that you're an isolated learner, though, because, you know, many children are isolated learners and they don't get a chance to uh, to demonstrate that or work in a way that suits them. OK, thank you, Minori. We'll move on. I don't want to waste any more of your time. OK, now I've got you a giveaway here, guys. This is a this is something I made very recently and I want you to in a second, I'll explain what this is before you want to download it. So. With our students in our classrooms, we want to encourage as much independence as possible. So you might be working with three children on a table and you're teaching a small lesson on dinosaurs. But you've got another 27 students in your room who all need you. They all need you. They can't survive without you because you are the teacher. But that's not necessarily true. Because if you tell them, look, everyone's going to do this work now i'm working over here with these three children i know the rest of you you might finish your work a little bit early and if you do do not worry about it because there are 100 practical life activities and i made this work card for you and i made a list of 100 practical life activities students can do in the classroom it's not direct learning or teaching. However, it does allow them to learn essential skills in the room. Now, if you get your telephone and you just hold up the camera to that QR code, it will download you a 100 practical life activities that parents and teachers can use in their classroom. You can also send this home to all your families and the families in the houses can stick it on the fridge and say to their students, okay, I would like you to do one of these things every day for the next 100 days. And you might see the first one says, plant some seeds. If you look at the first one at the top of the list, it says, plant some seeds. 
Okay, and some of these can be in the classroom, some of these can be at home, and they allow students to practice real life skills that you might not see as academic skills, but, but they're extremely useful for our students. So if you scan the QR code, you'll download a document, you can then save it to your phone, you can email it to yourself, and you can use that and share it as much as you want. What I'm a Montessori teacher, and what Montessori said was this, that work for, the, for, the, for an adult is never work for the child. So any of you that have children at home, when you're vacuuming, if you ask your child to vacuum, they would love it. They love to be like mom. They love to be like dad. They love to do those things. And so I've made this 100 practical life activity sheet for you to be able to use in your classrooms. Every child can have it in their book. If they finish their work and you are busy, they go to this chart and they can choose one that they would like to do. Now, Menorah, did you download it? Did it work okay? Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Gavin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Now we're we're at the, the end of the final session here. Now I my understanding was at this point, I'm just going to stop sharing here. At this point, we we're going to have 15 minutes of questions and answers. And then we'll go on to the next round. So uh, without further ado, if anyone has any questions and they want to unmute yourself and you want to ask that question, you want to put on your camera so we can see who you are, that would be wonderful. Um, any questions from you, Yamali, or Miss Nura? Anything from you that's jumped out? There's a question from Christine at the beginning of the session when you were asking about them regarding the issues that they uh, have uh, in their classrooms. So Christine was asking about different how to handle different levels of students in the same group. How to handle different levels of student in the same group well it depends number one on the size of the group obviously but what i like to do personally i run a montessori school so our classrooms do not have one age group in each room we have in one classroom we'll have three age groups so we'll have for example in one classroom we have 12 year olds 11 year olds and 10 year olds all in the same room and the idea is with a multi-age classroom that the students get to work at the level they're at, and I get to choose which lessons they come to. So when you establish a level of independence in your classrooms, so everybody is as independent as possible, while all of your students are busy, you know that I just talked about that window of time when you say, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to inspire you, now I'm going to ask you some questions, and now I'm going to let you go, you can work with whoever you want, and you can represent your research in a way that suits you. However, Thomas, Stephen, Nusha and um, Philomena, I want you to come over here with me onto this table. I'm going to be working with you. And the idea is that while they're all independently working, you get to work with a group that you want to work with and you pick that group. The students have no idea why you're picking the group, but you're picking it because those students might need a little bit of extra help, some extra attention. They might be working at the same level. You need to bring them all together. And that's what independence allows you to do. When we establish a routine of independence in our classrooms and students get to work on their own more often than not, you have time. You have time to work with groups that you choose. It might be a group of children you wanna push really hard because they're really, really smart. It might be a group of children who have low confidence and they really can't choose. It might be a group of children who need extra help. But the idea is that one of the biggest complaints that teachers face at the moment in the world is they don't have time. They're just at the front and they're teaching, 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 talking, 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 like some kind of showman at the front of the classroom. And they never get time to work one-on-one -on -one with a child or with a small group. But when we have that independent window, which takes about 60% of the lesson time away, where they're going to research and work together, you have time to observe and also pick a group to work with too. And that allows you to work with children from, from any differentiated age group or ability group. And I think that's the secret to having, um, to having uh, you know, the freedom within limits within every lesson, if possible. I think teachers find it very hard though, letting go, very hard, because to say, off you go, it feels a little bit chaotic at that point. You're like, oh my God, 
I, 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 it's, it's getting out of control. Everyone's moving around. Everyone's talking. What if the principal comes in? Oh my God, I look like a terrible teacher because everyone's moving and people are walking and people are talking. But if you go to Google head office or you go to Wikipedia or Amazon or you go to Tesla or you go to SpaceX and you walk into the head office, do you think everyone's sitting down silent in rows listening to Elon Musk talk about rockets? No, they're not. They're all sitting at tables and debating and discussing and standing up and drawing and working on the floor and having debates and solving problems and having arguments, but getting out of those arguments. And that is what we want our classrooms to be like, because that's the real world. No one goes to school, no one goes to work and sits in silence all day just listening to someone talk. It's extremely boring and nothing good ever comes out of that. So we need to build our classrooms just like the real world, because children will fall out with each other. Children will lose concentration. Children will lose focus, just like we do. And we need, our job is to allow them to navigate their way through that and come out the other end. So, uh, yes, I hope that answers the question. And I wonder, is there any more questions? Or if not, we can go into the next presentation because the next one is a long one, but it's a very, very good one. Any more questions, teachers? There's another question, Mr. Gavin. Please share some hints to maintain an interactive and interesting, never boring online classroom. Ah, yes, this is a very, very good question. I have actually just been teaching for 15 weeks online too, myself, and it can be a bit boring because it's just you're looking at the camera and the camera, the children are looking at you. Um, I think there's two things. Children are creatures of routine. They like the same thing every single day. They like the same, they need to, they need to know what they're getting. What's the structure? First of all, we have a book open, then we put the title, then we write down the key words, then there's gonna be a diagram, then I'm gonna talk, then you're going, to, you're going to break out rooms. But I think with today's technology, there are many ways that we can establish a real sense of deeper learning and online learning. And one tip I will give our teachers today, and I wish if I was at school, I could show you something amazing, which I can't show now, but we can do this another time, I'm sure. With your, um, with your iPhone and a very simple cable plugged into your laptop, you can actually have a camera overhead. So if you can imagine, there's a camera overhead of my table here, of my desk. And with a small flick of a switch on my computer screen, I can go from having a front camera to an overhead camera. And allowing the students to see your hands, cutting paper, doing experiments, is a really, really good way of turning a lesson and making it very, very interactive. Um, it's very, very simple. One cable and just your normal telephone will allow you to have an overhead camera. You just need a small bracket to hold it into. And it's a really, really good way to engage your students, but also, Using things like breakout rooms and allowing them to go away and do research on their own to say, I'm going to teach you about dinosaurs now, but after 20 minutes, I'm going to hit the breakout groups and you're all going to go into breakout groups and I'm going to leave you for 25 minutes to come up with an idea about you know, some research or some questions or whatever it's going to be and leave them. Leave them to work together, leave them to talk, leave them to interact because with online learning, that is what's really missing the interaction between students. And I think that's really, really important, but I'm hoping for you that you're soon coming out of lockdown anyway. So fingers crossed, online learning will be you know, a thing of the past soon. We just stopped here in Australia. So I'm hoping where you are, that it will also be a thing of the past very soon too. My fingers are crossed for you anyway. All right, thank you so much, Gavin. Uh, right. Any more questions, teachers? Um, actually, I have one. Can I ask? Yeah. Um, Gavin, you mentioned about the breakout rooms. Now, um, I do that with my students on Zoom. I'm not too sure if that's available on Microsoft Teams because I have not. Are you familiar with that? Do you yes, that? you can use it on. Yes, Teams has the same availability to do that. Yes. Where is it, Gavin? I, I don't know, actually. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find it. I had the same issue. I had to find it, too, because I was using okay. Teams. But I will tell you, I will tell you, um, um, I don't know if you've ever used Google Earth, but Google Earth allows you to go, um, you can screen share using Google Earth. And if you are researching any part of history, 
instead of showing videos, you can actually take the students on a real journey. So you'll go into Google Earth and you say, we're going to go, we're studying volcanoes. We're actually going to go to Kota Kinabalu right now in Borneo. And we're going to have a look at it. And you go into Google Earth and zoom and you zoom and you fly to Kota Kinabalu and all the children go, wow, we're going to Kota Kinabalu. And then you go to the top and you can zoom in, you can take a tour, you can go around it. You could then go to Vesuvius in Italy. You can go to Great Barrier Reef. You could go to Peru and everything is high definition satellite imagery so it, it looks and feels as if you're actually there and it's wonderful because right now our students are not able to travel neither are we so if we can't travel let's take them on a virtual trip and number two montessori said something really interesting she said if you can't take your students to the world bring the world to them and that's the idea and we can do that virtually because we have things like Google Earth now. And Google Earth allows us to go anywhere we possibly can and anywhere we want. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if you can download it onto your desktop and uh, it works really well. I've used it a lot. No matter what you're studying or where you're teaching in terms of history or geography, you can take a trip there, a virtual trip. You can even walk down the streets. You can go on a virtual walk through the streets of Rome. And the children are like, wow, this is Rome. This is fantastic but they have never been there. It's very inspiring. Okay, we'll move on because we're gonna run out of time otherwise. Yeah. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to follow my own rules here. I told everybody that, um, that the perfect structure of a perfect lesson is to tell you why you're bothering to be here. Like, why are you even here? You know, what's the point in being here? There's 123 people here. What is the point in being here? Well, the point in being here today is that tomorrow or in the future, you get to go away and you get to try some of these things. I hope so far that when you go to your classrooms, in the next time you went to your classroom and the children are in school, that the first thing you will do is start to try and understand what kind of learners you have in your room. You'll get a roll of all the children. You say, okay, my first job is to find out what type of learners I have in this room by giving them some freedom. Number two, I hope that you will structure your lessons slightly differently so that you are not at the front the whole time as the entertainer, that you are giving some time for independent work to take place in every single session. And you are also giving freedom within limits. You can use anything in the room. You can sit wherever you like and you can work with whoever you choose. This will allow... What sounds like you causing chaos will actually give you more time for you to observe your students. And we're going to go to that section right now. The next PowerPoint I'm going to show you is my favorite PowerPoint. Now, I have a strong suspicion at the end of this, many of you will be crying, which is fine. It's very powerful, this one. I've done this uh, seminar before. I'm actually um, talking at the World Education Summit in March after Barack Obama in March. Barack Obama is talking and then I'm talking next. And I'm going to tell this story and I'm going to share it with you first today. I told somebody the other day in Turkey and everybody was crying. So I will share that with you. Now the next section I'm going to show you is this. By the way, the tears of joy, so don't worry that you're gonna be crying, not tears of sadness. So you won't be devastated. You'll actually be crying with tears of happiness, hopefully. Now, the, uh, the second thing we're going to do is this. We're going to have a look at how important these core skills are. We talked about essential skills. We're going to have a look at how, how important they are and actually what they look like in our classrooms. Okay, so let me very quickly share my screen again. Somebody has their camp microphone on. Okie dokie. So here we go. All right. Now, you may have heard of the, um, the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. I would like to turn that upside down and tell you, it takes the child to raise the village. And we're going to talk about the importance of children's independence and the skills that children have. And along the way, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me too. Um, because part of this journey that we're on together is about finding our own passion too. If we're passionate as teachers, our students will be passionate too. So the reason I've chosen this picture here 
is because I built many schools in the Himalayan region, maybe 10 or 12 schools in Nepal. Every, every school holiday for the last five years, I fly to Nepal and I build a school on my own with my own two hands. I collect all the materials, I collect the money, I fly there and I build a school in a village and then I just leave. I train the teachers and I leave the school and I leave it. And it gives me a great deal of happiness. Now I took this photograph here, these students, didn't have a school. In fact, they were working just outside on the grass. I built them a school, I put them in the classroom and I told them, now here's how you use this piece of material. This is a Montessori material, the cylinder blocks. I showed them and then I said, you can work with whoever you want, you can do whatever you like, but at the end, you have to teach somebody else. So this little boy, he got a group of students together and he decided to teach them a lesson. I didn't even ask him to do that. I just gave them freedom. And this is what he did. And it nearly made me cry because you can see, look at the children all waiting around to be taught. There's no teacher, there's no adult, there's nothing. There's just a, a four-year-old teaching a group of four-year-olds how to use something. They are happy, they are engaged, they are all responsible, they are mature, they know that I trust them. And then some of them were looking at me saying, are we really allowed to do this? Can we really do this? Of course you can do this. This is your classroom. Now, it takes a child to raise a village. And what I'm going to show you today is when we give our students these wonderful skills and when we give them freedom and when we trust them, magical things happen. And I'm going to show you the most magical thing that's ever happened in a classroom of mine in the last 25 years since I've been a teacher. Okay, the point is, we do not know what the future is going to look like because none of us are Nostradamus. We don't have a crystal ball and we can't see into the future. We do, we do know that skills will always have a place in the world. Skills like communication, love, empathy, understanding, resilience. These things will never, never die. It doesn't matter if robots take over the world, if we have self-driving cars or we all live on Mars skills will always have a place. And today we're going to learn about the importance of those skills. I hope you enjoy this. This is one of my favorite presentations. And I've got lots of beautiful pictures in here to share with you too, and I hope you like them too. So how can schools include the whole community when preparing students for a future we are yet to understand? This is my favorite picture of all time ever. These students are the most magical, happiest people in the entire world, big smiles, this made my whole life worthwhile. And this is what teaching is all about. This is what passion is all about. This is what we are all about. You know, we're all teachers here today. We're not here for money. You don't get much money being a teacher. You're not ever going to be a millionaire. We're here for one reason only. And that's because we love children and we want them to be amazing in the future. We are destroying the world. We're cutting down the rainforest. We're polluting the oceans. We're poisoning the air. It's terrible. We're actually doing a really bad job. It's these children here that are the leaders of tomorrow, and they're the ones who are going to fix the problems that we've caused today. And that is the reason why we all go to school every single day. Now, just to share some knowledge about me, this is my school. I'm the principal of Farmhouse Montessori School. That is my school just there. I'm very, very lucky. I have a school on top of a mountain overlooking the ocean. We're very fortunate. I'm not saying we're not. Uh, and just want to share something amazing with you. Um, this is Australia. So my school is that center point there. And that bushland around there is filled with kangaroos, filled with snakes. Now, sometimes we're playing in the playground and a big black snake will just come slithering through the playground. The children will all run into the school. Or maybe 50 kangaroos will just jump past the classroom window at any given moment, as tall as me, two meters tall. Out there in the ocean, we have blue whales and humpback whales swimming past almost every single day. And we take our lunch out onto the rocks and we sit and we watch as the whales come by and we eat our sandwiches. And my students are so happy coming to school because school is not just about sitting in class and listening to me talk all day. School is about learning how to live this is Australia, the most dangerous country in the world with the most dangerous creatures on the planet. So I need to let them know that they are here. So we don't, you know, we don't avoid them. If a snake comes to the playground, well, that's fine. It's a snake. We know what to do. If we're out on the cliffs watching the whales, we learn about what, you know, living with the environment's like. But the most important bit is the students understand that they are not external to nature. 
They are part of nature. In fact, they are nature. And for anyone out there who, you know, I know I'm sure we have some Muslim teachers here. I'm, I used to work in a Muslim school for a very, very long time. And I know the Quran inside out, upside down and back to front. In fact, I learned a long time ago. Maybe later I'll, I will do some recitation for you as a, as a treat. But in the Quran, I know that nature is a very, very important part of being a Muslim. There's no question about that. And I don't work in a Muslim school now, but I take that with me every single day that our students are not separate from nature. They are nature. It's our obligation to teach them how to protect it and live in it, not just destroy it. Now, here we go. Let's get into the nitty gritty. And these are all footage from my school. I've taken some photographs here. So when we have a look at this, we have many schools around the world. And what they say is they are project-based learning schools. They use that magical term, project-based learning. But actually, what is project-based learning? What really is it? It's not about just doing a project every now and then. Many schools have it on their website. We are a project-based learning school. Project-based learning is about saying this to the students. I am going to teach you something. And at the end of this, I do not mind what your research looks like. Now, let me tell you about this picture here. So we did a lesson on the human heart. It's in the curriculum. I'm sure it's in the curriculum where you are too. You will learn about human biology. You will learn about the human heart. So I taught a lesson on the human heart. Now, it wasn't so good. It was a little bit boring, to be honest with you. I just taught the functions of the heart, the aorta and the valves and how blood flows and how oxygen is oxygenated into the blood. But then I said to the students, what would you like to know about the human heart? And every hand went up in the classroom, every single hand, and they all had questions, everyone. And one of the most important questions was, what happens when you have a heart attack? Now, actually, I didn't know the answer to that question. And I said to the students, that's a really good question. I do not know what happens when you have a heart attack. And the students said, I'd like to find out. So I said, well, how? He said, well, we want to get a heart and we want to cut it open and have a look inside. I said, it's a great thing. I went to the butcher shop. I bought some hearts. I brought them to school. And I said to the students, for anybody who wants to do their research by opening a heart and looking inside a heart, you can. These two boys, they put on their goggles. They put on their white coats. And for that day, they dissected hearts all day long. Some of them had come from lambs that had had heart attacks and some not. And they were trying to find the differences within them. It was amazing. Now, incidentally, these two boys, one of them wants to be a vet and the other one wants to be a doctor. Now, if I made them write me a report, do you think they would be happy at writing a report or dissecting hearts all day? And hearts are not very much money from a butcher shop but they had the most wonderful day of all. This dissecting hearts wasn't for everybody, but it certainly was for these boys. And this is what project-based learning is all about. Saying to the students, I don't mind what you do for your research. It is up to you. If you have an idea, I'll try to make it happen. That's when you find your students extremely inspired. Now, Montessori says something really interesting, an amazing quote from Maria Montessori. She said, at some given moment, it happens that a child becomes deeply interested in a piece of work. We see it in the expression on his face, his intense concentration, his devotion to the exercise. And I want to encourage every teacher in this seminar today, if you see a child who is deep in concentration on something, try your best to leave them alone. Leave them alone. If they're working on something and for the next four hours, leave them. Because when you are in the flow state, when you are in deep flow state, amazing, amazing learning takes place. It is not our right to stop a child in the middle of something they love. They will hate it. You are doing an injustice to the child. Doesn't matter. You can catch up later on. If they miss mathematics one day, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow, they do double mathematics. That's your job to manage. Leave them as much as you can. Now, let's talk about online learning. Somebody asked earlier on, hey, how do we make, you know, what makes a good online learning session? Well, let me give you some perspective here, everybody. You see, when our students are really interested in what they're doing, they will go to great lengths to learn. Now, in autumn of 1937, there was a rapid, rapidly spreading virus. Ooh, this sounds uh, familiar, doesn't it? We've just had something like this. 
A rapidly spreading virus with no known cure made it too dangerous for children to attend school. This was polio, by the way, for you, those of you who don't know. It was a child killer. This polio was a child killer. Now, it was really hard for students to go to school. Now, in the UK, what happened was the government employed 13 teachers, the best in the country, to teach over the radio. They said every day, maths, Barbara, you're teaching maths to the whole country at nine o'clock. At 10 o'clock, Mr. Thomas, you're teaching English to the whole country over the radio. And they didn't choose the teachers because they were good teachers. They chose the teachers because they were inspirational. And what happened? Everybody was inspired to learn, even over the radio. You couldn't even see them, but they were amazing storytellers. And the idea is this. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how good your degree is. It doesn't matter how good your classroom is or how expensive your materials are. If you are not inspired to teach, your children will not be inspired to learn. And this is absolutely key. So I want you to have a think about this. When you're planning your next lesson, when you're at home planning your lesson, look at that lesson. If that lesson is not good, if you look at your lesson content and you go, oh God, it's a very boring lesson. I actually don't even like it myself. You need to rewrite that lesson. You need to write it again. Because if you're bored, your students will definitely be bored. And what we don't want is bored students. Now, our job is to find our student's hook. And you might be thinking, Gavin, why do you have a picture of an aeroplane on this photograph? Now, remember I showed you a picture of my school with the bush out in the countryside? Well, I was walking with my students in the bush. And we were walking out to the rocks to watch the whales. And I saw this aeroplane in the distance. And I stopped the class and I said, hey, kids, look over there. It's a Lancaster bomber, which is a special type of aeroplane. One little boy put his hand up and he said, Gavin, by the way, he was seven. He said, Gavin, that is not a Lancaster bomber. That's a Globemaster three. You can tell by the shape of the engines. And I said, okay, thank you for telling me. I'm so happy you know. But what I realized in that moment is that he knew every single aircraft there was in the world. He was an aircraft specialist. He loved aircraft. At that moment, I decided that every single lesson he was going to learn for the next week was going to be about aircraft or war. So we did maths about war. We did English about aircraft. We did art about aircraft. We did history of aircraft. We did the geography of aircraft. We did everything around aircraft. And for that one week, he believed he was coming to school to follow his dream, to follow his passion. And if we can do that, if you know your students well enough, you will know each and every one of their dreams and you can bring them to school and inspire them along the way, meaning they will be so happy, so happy to come to school. And we talk about our classrooms. I like to not use the word classroom. I call it the prepared environment. Your job as a teacher is to make sure that you are prepared. And that doesn't mean having a document. Yes, a document's great. What it means is, is your classroom ready to receive your students, the students that you have? Now, I'm going to give you a tip, one that you're never going to forget right now. I'm going to, get your, I'm going to give you a hook because you're all teachers. If you have a noisy classroom, if your classroom is a little bit noisy, I want you to try this. Take a small speaker, connect it to your iPhone or a computer, and play a YouTube video on birdsong. You can Google birdsong. OK, and very quietly and subtly in the corner, you have bird songs just tweeting from the forest in the corner. The students don't even know it's there. Just like magic, like this, your classroom will be calm and will be quiet. And you think, no, Gavin, I don't believe you. Well, let me tell you, I've tried it in many, many classrooms. The reason your classroom goes quiet and calm is this. When we used to live in jungle, when we were cavemen many years ago, when birds were singing in the trees, that meant there were no predators that were going to eat us. There were no tigers, no boars, no wild pigs, no buffaloes. There was nothing that was going to attack us. So birds sang because there were no predators. When there was, and so we felt calm because there was nothing that could possibly eat us. 
But when there was no bird song, we felt anxious because the birds had flown away. Now, when you play bird song in a noisy classroom, your students immediately become to calm down and become, oh, this is beautiful. So for any teachers in this meeting today, and you think, my classroom sometimes is a little bit noisy after lunchtime. When the kids come back from lunchtime, it's a little bit noisy. That's when you have 30 minutes of bird song playing behind the plant, hidden away. The kids don't even know it's there. Take note. Your classroom will be calm as anything very, very quickly. And the reason why is because it's proven in your DNA, in history, you were, this was part of how we evolved. Now, the power of saying yes. Your students are going to come to you and they're going to say, Miss, can I use paper? Miss, can I use paint? Miss, do you think I can build a dinosaur? Miss, do you think I can make a volcano out of papier-mâché? Miss, can I use the felted pens? Miss, can I use the colours? Miss, can I sit with Thomas? Miss, can I go to the bathroom? Miss, 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 miss. Your answer is this. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You don't need to ask me anymore. You know the rules of this classroom. Everything is a yes as long as it's safe. No, you can't climb out of the window and run away. That's not allowed. But you can do everything inside the classroom. You can use the paints as long as you put them back. You can use the pencils as long as they're sharp when they're finished. You can sit with whoever you like as long as you're not too rowdy. The answer is yes. Now, in 2017, I was given the opportunity to go to the Himalayas and build a school. And in the top picture, you find that there are some, some children I met in a place called Noel Parasi. It's on the Indian border. They had no school. They had never seen a book in their life. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Nothing. So I went to my students at school and I said, hello, students. This is my students here in Australia. And I said, look, I want to build a school but I don't have any books, I don't have any pencils, I don't have any paper, can you help me collect all of the items? And my students said, yes, these are my students. So I put outside my office 20 suitcases, and I said to the students, I can't do this alone, I need your help. You need to go home and find anything you don't need in the house and bring it in. You bring it in, I'll fill the suitcases, I will take it, and I will make sure students get it. And when they get it, I'm going to bring it back and I'm going to show you what you did. And if you look back, look at the bottom photograph. I came back to my students and I said, at the top photograph, you have a lot of children who've never seen a book in their life. The bottom photograph is a lot of children with huge smiles on their face. And they've all got a book now. And behind them, they've got a school. You built them a school. And I said to the students, that is what you did. Not me, you. I was just the postman. You gave me all the money. You gave me all the books. I took them and I delivered them. And you brought happiness to children on the other side of the world. And these two children here said, Gavin, we want to do it again and again and again and again. And what they realized was they realized the power they had to change the world, even though they're only six years old. They got this this feeling that they had the power to do some good. And what our students find often is they feel helpless. And we do too. We look at the news, we see there's war, we see there's poverty, we see there's problems and we go, oh no, I can't do anything about that. It's too far away. It is not the truth. You can do something about it. And our job is to find a way to give our students a chance to make a difference. It doesn't have to be building a school. It could be very simply making a poster about equality and sticking it in the local library. It could be a poster about cleaning up the local river and sticking it in the local post office. As long as it has an impact, our students will start to understand that they have the worth to be able to do that. Now, this was the first project we did as a school. I found on the top left corner, this was a school in a place called Noacot, which is just outside uh, Kathmandu. And you can look in the top left corner, there is just an, what looks like a prison cell. It's dirty. There's about seven children. There's no tables, no pencils, no books, no nothing. I came back to my students and I said, I need your help. And I showed them the picture in the top left corner. I said, I need your help. We've got to find a way to help those students. Now, many of, many of what we do in our classrooms, we just go on English, math, science, history, geography, all of these things, and we don't really focus on the skills. The skill of giving 
And the skill of having impact is a very important skill. So I gave my students a challenge. I gave them the top room on the left-hand corner. And I said, we need to fix up these children's lives. Do you need to help? And the students rallied. Some made posters, some had a bake sale, some had a garage sale, some collected books, some collected clothes, some collected money, and they gave it all to me. I flew there and you can see the progression over a weekend. We painted the walls, we then painted some hills, we then put the carpets in, and just in two days, we changed the room in the top left corner to the room in the bottom right corner. And then we let the students come in and we showed them their new classroom. And I took this picture back to my school and I said to the students, look what you've done again. You've changed some other people's lives. And the students said, oh my God, I'm gonna do it again. They started to get addicted and the projects got bigger and bigger and bigger. And you might think to yourself, but Gavin, that's not learning. Like, where's the English? Where's the maths? Where's the science? Well, they had to communicate. They had to write letters to people to get funds. They had to make posters, which is art. They had to work in teams, which is collaboration. Everything in the curriculum was built into this project. And together as a school, we managed to change all of these students' lives now. I went back to school and I said to the kids, look what you've done. They said, oh my God, we want to do more. So we started to do more and it gets bigger and bigger. So Gandhi, Gandhi said, you will never experience true happiness until you help somebody who can never ever repay you. And this is very, very apt and very, very important. The boy on the right hand side, he had never ever seen a piece of paper in his life. That was his first drawing. Now, the paper was given to him by a child at my school. The pencils behind him are from a child at my school. The table that he's working on outside is from a child at my school. I came back to my students and I said, look at the girl teaching the other students with the pink tower. One of the students from my school gave her that pink tower. This is a girl in Northern India in a place called Ladakh. She's teaching her students. I said to the students, look what you've done. These students are now learning thanks to you. I said to the students, look at this boy on the right hand side. He's drawn his first ever picture thanks to you. And the students started to understand that they had a power to change the world. So, I talk about freedom within limits a lot, but freedom within limits in a mixed age classroom combined allows for differentiation to occur naturally. Many of you as teachers will have heard the word differentiation. It's a very big word and many, many times it's thrown at you to say you must differentiate your lessons. But when you have a mixed age classroom and you give the students freedom, differentiation will happen on its own. Children will gravitate to work where they need to work. Now, this is a very, I, I, I urge anyone who's got a camera to take a photo of this slide. This is the epitome of everything we need to know as teachers. As a teacher, we need to think about this completely like this. This slide is the most important one of all for me. Because as a teacher, we work at the top. Your job is to differentiate the content, so that's to change what you teach, to change how you teach, so the process, and to change what the result is. That's your job, okay? You will change what you teach, you will change how you teach it, and you will change what the outcome is. That's, that's your job. But what you must know, and this is the middle column here, is how ready are your students to learn in that content? Number two, what are the interests of your students? Do you know them all? Have you had a conversation? Have you listened to them? And number three, their learning profile. Do they have abilities that you that are struggling? Are they, uh, are they excelling? Do you know the learning profile? Are they an isolated learner, collaborative learner, independent learner, cooperative learner? Do you know that? Now, when you change the content, the process and the product, and you know the readiness, their interests and how they learn, what you get as the result is you get growth, you get motivated students, and you get students who are extremely efficient. I can tell you right now, every single one of you in this meeting today wants to have students who are growing, students who are motivated, and students who are efficient. If you want all three of those at the bottom, you must make sure you are doing all the six ones at the top. And I qualify this by saying, if you do those six at the top, you will see the results at the bottom, are guaranteed 100%. 
So if there was one thing I was going to say for you to take a photograph of today, if you had a camera, I would say snap that, because that to me is the most important part about being a teacher. And that is the structure we need to follow in terms of our own criteria. So the more we limit the freedoms of our students, the more difficult differentiation becomes. Now, this is a school in Uganda. Uh, this is a guy called Thomas. He's a good friend of mine. He runs a school in Uganda. There are 70 students in his class. They're not allowed to move. They're not allowed to talk. They're not allowed to do anything. They just have to sit and listen all day long. Two things. They will only be as smart as the teacher. And some of them are probably smarter than the teacher in certain aspects. Number two, he'll probably only be able to teach the middle children. The ones on the right-hand side our students are probably isolated learners, independent learners, cooperative learners, parallel learners, but they can't work that way. The ones on the left have got specific learning needs maybe, but they can't be met. So this classroom, although it's not his choice, is going to fail almost half of the students because they're not given any freedom whatsoever. However, this is what many schools look like today. They look exactly like this. And we need to change that paradigm of what schools actually look like. If there was movement in here, if there was choice, if there was freedom, we'd see the students starting to teach and learn from each other. Now, this is really, really interesting. I talked about Wikipedia, Amazon, Google head office earlier on. Look on the left-hand side. The left-hand side is a Montessori classroom for three to six-year-olds. I can't see the teacher anywhere. I can see freedom. Some students are working where they want. Some are standing up. Some are sitting in pairs. Some are sitting on the floor. There's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of choice. There's a lot of movement. On the right-hand side, that is the head office of Airbnb, one of the most profitable companies on the entire planet. I can see that they're quite similar in many ways. They both have freedom. They both have choice. They both have movement. They both have collaboration. They're both successful very, very successful. If we go back, quite the opposite to this, quite the opposite. What we need to think about is, do our classrooms reflect what happens in the real world? The real world in Airbnb is that people get to choose and move and have freedom of choice. And that's where the creativity comes in. Airbnb is one of the most creative companies on the planet. And look, there's no rows, there's no desks, there's no sitting in pairs or in order. So can we change the way our classrooms look to give freedom, to give choice, to give movement, to give conversation? Yes, it might be a little bit of a change with your leadership team, but once it gets going, you'll find amazing success in your classrooms. Now let's look at empathy, for example. People say, well, you know, empathy how do I even teach empathy? Is that really important? Well, in today's world, empathy is extremely important. So empathy, it teaches many skills indeed. Awareness, it gives the children a huge amount of understanding of where they are and who they are. It allows them to have understanding of their position on earth and other people's position. It allows them to communicate, a very important core skill. It allows them to have consideration for other people's perspectives, something we often forget. It allows them to grow with respect. It allows them to know and be known also, to see and be seen, but also have clarity that we're all working towards one common goal. Empathy is only one skill in many skills that we need to give our students. And I have designed something to help you to do this. So essential skills are skills for the future skills that we don't often include in our curriculum because our students are sitting silently in rows looking at the front while we talk. Now, what I did, I did some research with the top 100 organizations on earth. And I did some research of what skills they were looking for when they were employing their new staff members. Because obviously they get a lot of really good resumes. They get a lot of really good, um, you know, in terms of qualifications, but just because you have good qualifications and a good resume doesn't mean you're going to be really good at your job. So here's what I did. I took the top 40 skills they needed and I split them up into 40 weeks. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is this, and I'm going to give you this to download in a second, don't worry, is each week to have, for example, if you look at week one in term one, it's humility. 
Many people don't have humility. They don't even know what humility is, okay? But being humble is a being proud of yourself, but quiet with how proud you are, not to show off, not to say, look at me, look how great I am. I'm so successful, I've got a great day. It's just to be quiet and content with who you are. So week one might be humility week. And it means that the story that you read that week is about someone who was humble. It means that when you're having a circle time in your group on the carpet with your class, you're talking about humility. It means that when you're reflecting to your students about how well they've done, you say, I love the way that Ibrahim was so humble in the way that he represented his work. So what I've done, I've broken them all up into 40 weeks. I'm going to give you this document. And what I encourage you to do is use it in your school. So week one, humility. Week two is all about love. Week number three is about humor. Week number four is about compromise. Week number five is about independence. And you're going to have that on a big board in the classroom. This week is Independence Week. We're going to encourage you to be independent as possible. I'm going to tell you stories about independence. I'm going to point out people who've been really independent. You're going to tell me about times when I've been independent. We're all looking at independence this week. And what you will have is you will have students who get to practice these wonderful, wonderful essential skills. And it's these skills here that will save the world tomorrow. It's not knowing facts, it's skills. So what I've done is I've made you a copy. If you scan this QR code here, you will download a essential skills planner. It's a four page document and it will allow you to teach those essential skills in your school. Can I encourage you to scan the QR code now with your phone and it will download the document onto your phone. You can then save it, email it, keep it and use it later. I will leave this here for 60 seconds while you do that. While you're doing that, I will tell you something really interesting. So if you are in kindergarten today, if you're a kindergarten child today, you will graduate from high school in 2033. So that is going to be 12 years away from now. And you might think, Gavin, why are you bothering to tell me that? Well, I'm telling you because of this. You see, in 12 years time, we have no idea what academics our students will need, or even if ac academics will be important. We don't know what they will need. What we do know is the skills they will need. They'll still need love. They'll still need humanity. They'll still need independence. They'll still need empathy, understanding, perseverance, consideration, understanding. They'll still need all of these things. And let me put this in perspective for you. 12 years ago, in 2009, there was no iPhone. It hadn't been invented. Google Maps hadn't been created. Electric cars were nothing. No one even thought of them before. So if we think about it like that, in 12 years time from now, who knows what the world is going to look like? We have no idea, but we do know that those skills are extremely important. Now for the next part, this is where everybody usually starts crying. This is where I'm going to show you and tell you a small story. These are four students from my school. The same students who previously I showed you had been helping me build schools in the Himalayas. So I had an objective. I got them in my office and I said, okay, girls, what I want you to do is I want you to change the world. I want you to change the world in some way. I don't mind how small or how big, but your objective is you've got four weeks to change the world. So I didn't give them anything else. And I encourage you to do this too with your students. Write this down for sure. This is the part that melts my heart. This is the part that makes teaching worthwhile. And I hopefully you'll take inspiration from this. So these are four girls. They are 10 years old. And I told them, I want you to change the world. So the first thing they did is they came up with their own company name, CAMP, C-A-M-P. That's an acronym for all of their names. So I got them in my office, first of all. Now, here's a summary. When we allow our students to follow their passion, to find their niche, and to work with true intention and purpose, the essential skills that will set them up for life are taught not by us, the teachers, but through experience. This is the only way we can teach essential skills is through experience. So let's see what the girls did. By the way, Miss Nora, you are going to love this. I, I'm sure you're going to love this. So number one, 
I got them in my office. I said, girls, I need you to change the world. Here's my computer. Do your research. I'll give you one day to tell me how you are going to change the world. So they were on my computer, started to do their research. Now, I will fill you in with something. They were recently studying Burma in one of their projects, and they discovered that the Rohingya Muslims in Burma were being persecuted by the army, and they were being sent to Australia, some of them as refugees. So they decided that they wanted to help Burmese refugees as they arrived in school. Now, many people will argue, but Gavin, this is not education. This is not school. I will argue that if I look at these four girls here, they're working as a team, they're communicating, they're collaborating, they're planning, they're preparing, they're using global knowledge, they're using impact, they're using purpose. All of these things are education for sure. There's nothing to argue that. So off they go. They decided that what they wanted to do was have a bake sale in the playground, make some cakes and sell them and raise some money. And with the money, they were going to buy some backpacks, small backpacks, and they were going to give them to the community and ask the community to fill them up with pencils and pens and rulers and shoes and coats and hats. And when the Burmese refugees arrived here in Australia without any mother or father, they would give them the backpacks for their first day at school. And I said, oh my goodness, if you can actually do that, then this would be amazing. I said to the girls, what's your first plan? They said, Gavin, we want to show this to the, some of the mums at school. We're going to need their help. So I said to the girls, okay, well, if you're going to show them, you're going to need to make a PowerPoint presentation. So they went away and they made a PowerPoint presentation to persuade these mums that what they were about to do was a good idea. So they used persuasive language, high modality, technology, all of the things that we have in the curriculum, they are using. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking too much. Now, I called the parents into my office and the girls, they stood there and they presented their idea. And the mums were really overwhelmed and they were 100% in on the project. There's step one. Step number two, they had a bake sale and they raised, and I've got to tell you, $500 from the bake sale. That's a lot of money. They bought 140 backpacks. The little blue backpack you can see in the background, they bought 140 of them. So I said to the students, if you give these backpacks out to the parents, well, they'll put all their junk inside. We don't want junk for the refugee children. And the girls said, Gavin, don't worry. We're making a list for the families. We're giving the families freedom within limits. We're telling them, you can put anything in the backpack from this list. And they gave the backpack out to the families with the list inside, which is amazing because that's what I was talking about with freedom within limits. Now, next, they put some tables outside the school. And as the parents came to drop off their little babies at school, these girls, they stood there and they said, excuse me, where are you going? You're not going home yet. Take a backpack. And they gave every family a backpack. And they told them why. And they persuaded the families to be involved. And all of these mums and dads, they took a backpack home. And we waited one week. I said to the girls, well, this is the moment of truth. You will either receive the backpacks back or you won't. Now, a week later, all 140 backpacks arrived back at school, filled with shoes, pencils, hats, paper, books, toys, everything that a Burmese refugee is going to love. And I said to the girls, girls, why have you ordered green, blue, and black? And then they said, Gavin, the blue ones are for three to six-year-olds. The black ones are for six to nine-year-olds. And the green ones are for nine to 12-year-olds. We put items inside which are age appropriate. And I was like, wow, even I didn't think of that. And this is what happens when you give children intention and purpose and freedom. Look at the management they've got. Look at the success they've had already. But what's really important, Miss Nora, here is that we allow the students to finish the, pro the project. They must, they must, 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 they must see that these bags reach the children they want. So I said to the girls, well, now you've got the backpacks. How are you going to get them 
to the Burmese refugees. The girl said, Gavin, we have found two uh, organizations that take care of Burmese refugees. Can we use your telephone to call them? So of course you can. So they called them from my office and they invited the CEOs to my school for an interview. I said, why do you need to interview them? They said, Gavin, we want to make sure that their morals are correct before we give them our backpacks, which was amazing. The CEOs came into school. On the left-hand side, we have the Islamic Council of Australia. On the right-hand side, the House of Sikina, two charities that look after Burmese refugees. The girls interviewed them. They asked them questions. Why should we give our backpacks to you, they said. They wanted to choose their organization, which was amazing. Now, the girls chose the ladies on the right from the House of Sakina. And I said, girls, why did you choose that organization? And they said, Mr. McCormack, we are women and they are women. We want to hand them over to women. We believe in women empowerment. So I was like, this is fantastic. The House of Sakina arrived at school with their bus to collect the backpacks and we loaded them onto the bus. Now, what we could have done is we could have let the bus drive away and said to the girls, well done girls, you've done a wonderful job, but no. The most important part of anything is feedback. The students need to know the impact they have had. That's why I showed them every photograph early on. When they made a difference in the children's lives in India or Nepal, I always came back and said, look at the picture he's drawn. Look at the school you built. Look at the books they're reading. It's thanks to you. For these girls, what happened was something magical. We got actual feedback. At the very end here, we got the Burmese refugees arrived from Burma, having suffered persecution. And then they arrived at Darwin and our students got to see this video of the girls receiving their backpacks and opening them and finding that inside there are books and there are dictionaries. And every, look at the smiles on their faces. They know, these girls know, that somebody out there cares about them. Somebody out there loves them. Somebody out there wants them to be okay. And when you see them unpacking their backpack, they've got their first lunchbox. They've got their first little cuddly toy. They've got umbrellas and shoes and folders. And this is all because I gave the students freedom I said to them, I want you to change the world and you can decide how you change it. And they changed the world for these girls. But more importantly, what happened was they changed the world for themselves. Because at the very end of this, I turned to the students in my school and I showed them this video and I looked in their faces and those four girls from the charity camp, they were all crying and I was crying. And we were all crying. And I said, why are you crying? And they said, we want to do it again. We want to do it again and again and again. And the, the reality is at this point is we've shown them that even though they're 10 years old, they can change the world for somebody else. They can make a difference. And they've changed the world for themselves. They know how good it feels to be good and do good. And what we did we made sure that the curriculum was all involved in that project. And this is the true power of essential skills. This is the true power of freedom, of trust, and freedom within limits. And this is what we get. And I want to finish by saying thank you. And I'll finish with this final picture. This picture here is reminiscent of everything that I do and that you do. These are some students draw. This is the same boy who was drawing his first ever picture. Look at their faces. There's no price on that smile. You know, when the students realize, I put that smile on that boy's face, you know, and they're only seven years old. Education is a natural process carried out by the child, not acquired by listening to words, but experiences. This is all about experiences. We have to teach from the heart. You've got to teach from your heart. You've got to be prepared to put your heart on the line. But also, when you teach and you have passion, then you will feel so much more invested in the way that you teach. One test of the correctness of education is the happiness of your students. If you look at your students and they are not happy, you need to change something. 
whether you're not passionate yourself, your lessons are not good, or you are not meeting the needs of your students. If you ever want to decide, am I a good teacher? Look at the smiles on the students in your classroom. That is the qualifier of whether you are a good teacher or not. Nothing to do with the academic prowess, nothing to do with the good grades, nothing to do with how good your classroom looks, but the smile on the face of the students who sit before you. And I, I will finish my, my seminar, my webinar, by saying this. Students are not empty vessels waiting to be filled up by us. They are already full. They are waiting to experience the world. Our job is not to fill them up with information. Our job is to inspire them, to be change makers in the world and learn through experience. And that's why I shared the process of camp with you and the four girls who did the Burmese project. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed the seminar. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. I hope that there aren't too many tears out there. Um, you know, it's amazing to see these wonderful girls, subhanAllah, changing the world like this and doing these wonderful things. Um, if you see girls like this who are 10 years old, imagine what they'll be like at 16. Imagine what they'll be like as women in the future, as leaders, prime ministers, you know, company CEOs. Imagine the way that they will operate in the world. They will be amazing in the world because they already know their true power and they're only 10 years old. So I will finish there and I'll hand it over to you, Yamali, or from Miss Nora or any questions. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sorry I've been talking for so long. This is probably the longest seminar I've ever done, two hours, but um, I hope it's been enjoyable to everybody out there. Thank you so Thank much, Mr. Yeah. It was a very valuable uh, uh, session that all of us had. And I believe that we had a lot to learn from you today. Uh, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gavin. It was so touchy how the four girls worked on it to make a change for the children. And I hope it happens in this part of the world as well, because we hardly see uh, those kind of projects being done and uh, schools encouraging the children. Um, it's very rare. So I hope that teachers uh, here will uh, look forward to uh, you know, doing uh, projects like that in future, hopefully. Can I say a couple of things before, before you end? Uh, yes. And thank you for all the lovely comments, everybody. Um, over the last, um, over the last um, six months, I've actually been, um, there is a real movement in the world right now of teachers who want to teach like this. Uh, don't get me wrong. You know, we're not avoiding English, mathematics, geography, history, science. We're not avoiding these things. These are still very much included in the way that our teaching institutions work. But what we do is we just give this window of time every week, you know, one hour, two hours where you can live your dream. OK, you, you can call it whatever you want. You build it into the curriculum. And in that time, you let the students become change makers. You let them find a problem in the world and you allow them to try to solve it somehow. It doesn't matter if they don't completely solve it. We just want them to solve it, try to solve it and understand their true power. And in the last six months, I've reached out to many teachers around the world, and there are many teachers who want to join this. They want to have this in their schools. They want to have this in their classrooms. They want to be the teacher who has students who change the world. So what I did, I've made, um, I've made, uh, I've built a network, a, an online uh, network of teachers. I'll put it in the chat for everyone right now. So all it is, it's completely free. It's a membership. Um, it's a membership platform you join. It's called Education Influence. When you join Education Influence, you will see a huge map. And on that map, you will see lots of other teachers around the world who want to do the same as you. They want to change the world. You can collaborate. You can message them for free. You can share resources. You can communicate between your schools. I will put this into the chat now, and I want to encourage all of your listeners to, to jump on and join. There's no, I, it's completely free. I built it just for free so teachers can collaborate and work together. I promise you there's no money or anything coming out of this. I do it all myself for free. It's called educationinfluence.com. I'm putting it in the chat, and I encourage your uh, teachers to join. If you want, I can show you how it looks. Would you like to see how it looks? Yes, of course. 
So the reason we built this is there are so many teachers around the world who want to make a difference. They want to change the world. Uh, but unfortunately, they don't know where to start. They don't know where to start and they don't know where to reach out. They can't find that network. So what I did was I built the network myself and I found the teachers around the world who wanted to do that. Okay, I'll just show you very quickly then. So when you join, if you do join Education Influence, what you will find is this. Now I have to load it again. Sorry, everyone. I wish you'd have told me you couldn't see anything. It's my fault. Um, when you join this network, what you will see is there are many, many teachers who have profiles here. On the right-hand side, a map is about to load. Give it a second. Oh, how annoying that I did that. I didn't show you the screen. Uh, it's completely free to join. You just click up here in the Become an Influencer and you will have access to everything. There's free resources for everyone, free training every month uh, for free. In fact, there's a training coming up in a couple of weeks. It's just my internet is not working or loading. This is very embarrassing. In Australia, if there's a storm, our internet all fails, which I don't know if it's the same in Indonesia, but we had a big storm today. So, yes, you will have something like this. When you join, you will see there's a huge network of teachers here. Just let the map load. It's not the website. I'm so sorry. It's my internet. You will have access to all of these teachers here like this. And as you look closely, you can see we have teachers all over the world. You will join. And when you do join, you will become one of these teachers here. You will have your own pin. You'll be able to connect with any one of these teachers around the world you wish. You just have to find a teacher you like in a country you want to collaborate with. So, for example, if you might say, well, I, want, I would love to do some work in Somalia. Let's have a look at this teacher's profile. This guy is in Ethiopia, Oliver. You click his profile. It will take you through to his, um, his personal page. And then when you get to that personal page, you can connect with him. And then you can talk to him and say, can you tell me more about your school? Oh, my internet is not working. However, you get the, un you get the understanding. You get the understanding of how it works. So ignore my internet. I don't know why it's failing me, but never mind. Okay, I'll let you have a look later if you want. So for your teachers who are online now, if you want to join in, uh, join the network, I strongly encourage you. I do training every month for free on that network. So if you want to join, that would be brilliant. And then I would look forward to seeing you there and I will uh, give you a hand in joining if you get stuck or anything goes wrong. It's been really nice to be here and I really uh, I feel so honored to be welcomed. So thank you. I get many invitations to, to do talks, but um, you were so fantastic when I met you online and we prepared this together. And so if you ever need me again or you need any help, I encourage your uh, the students to reach out. Surely, Mr. Gavin. Mr. Gavin, would you mind, uh, you know, the other day you showed us, you showed me how to be teaching, you know, to put the camera up. On I top did. of that gadget, I forgot. I forgot the name. Actually, I wrote yeah. it down in the CR book, but I left it at home. If you yeah. can share it with the teachers, because it will be a, a very new technique here in Sri Lanka. Yes. Do you have I'm it sorry, you right now, or no? Because I was I was in my school, but now I'm in my home. All right, fine. So. We we can yeah, do it because, any other um, time. Most of the time, the teachers, you know, they, they show their face and then they yes. show how to do it like this. But then the, the flip over the other way around was quite That's right. Yeah. Well, look, I, I actually have it. Um, I've uploaded it on my, on my LinkedIn page. I've actually uploaded a video of how to do it. So maybe I will find it and share it with you and you can share it with your team. Teacher. She's asking whether she can join your webinars or keep in touch with you. Yes, of course. So look, what I will say to you is, if you want to keep in touch with me, join as a member on Education Influence, make a profile, and then every month I will be in touch with you. I have a, I have a webinar for free for every single member, every single month. Also, when you join, you just can access me all the time. You can just message me, DM me all day, every single day, whenever you like. The idea of education influence is that collaboration is key and we share everything. So uh, together we can change the world, but on our own, it's very difficult. So if you do need me or you need help, you need programs, resources, you need uh, other team members, you've got a project, you want to have 10 other schools to help you, everything will be on education influence. You can have everything you want. You can build your own project, you can read blogs, you can download lots and lots of resources. Every month we have a, a private, uh, what we call Spotlight, which is a, a seminar for free, 
And we last we did one two Sundays ago. We had 1,200 people joining from around the world. So um, please make a profile as soon as you possibly can. So I hope it's helped. It's been really nice to be here. Thank you, Yamali and Miss Nora. It's been yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Mr. Gavin. And it's been you, quite a worthwhile two hours with lots of information and lots of leadership skills, something very new. Yes. Apart from methodologies, this was a new approach for all the teachers here. So everyone is appreciating you and uh, your tips and your hints on how to get along with our students. Thank you so much for the tips and so many things were new to me as well, being in the field of teaching for a while. So lots yeah. of new things to learn from you. Okay, Miss Nora. I'm and sorry, uh, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's the... Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Take care. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Minori. Thank you, Miss Nora and Yamali. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you, God bless you.